All righty, Shalom Abracha, friends. Thank you to all who are joining on Facebook. I guess the time change is a little bit difficult for people. It's Ben Azman, it's vacation, it's the summer. And so that's completely understandable. But we're going to give this year, regardless to everybody, whoever is post, who is joining us on Facebook, not that you guys are Bidyevit in any way, but it's always nice to have our regular Hevra over Zoom. And of course, this year is recorded so that whoever is following along with the series will be able to continue to do so. So tonight we're going to cover Sicha Saran, Nun Dalid, Nun He, and Nun Vav, 44, 45, and 46, three Sichas tonight. And we're just going to jump right, right into it. And I hope everybody had a meaningful Tisha B'Av experience. And the Siyat Rashmaya, we're part and parcel, as everybody knows, of really bringing the Geula Mamish every single day that we do our avaydas and that we're pushing forward to be it in, in the sweetest, most wonderful, beautiful way. So, Ashrenu. Okay, so here we're going to share the screen with Hashem's help, and we are going to begin. Okay, one second here. That's not the right one. Um, nor is that. One second. One second, we're going to share our screen and begin. Okay, we got it. Now, now let me just share the screen. Okay, there you go. Not that either. Okay, finally, <laughs> we got it. Okay, so Bisiyat Rishmaya, let's jump into Sicha Saran Nun Dalid. And the Rebbe says a very beautiful thing here. Bisiyat Rishmaya, thank you guys for joining. So the Eilig Tzadik says, Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev, Schuse Yagan Aleinu Val Kol Yisrael Amim. He says, Hashem Yisbarach Einoi Oise Shnei Pa'amim Davar Echad. He says, Hashem never does the same thing twice. Amazing thing. Hashem never does the same thing twice. We know, what is there that a Kodesh Baruch Hu does not do? Everything's Latav, everything's Toiv, Latav Avid. And that means that Mamish, everything in the world, whatever it is that a Kodesh Baruch Hu is doing, never ever is it done twice the same thing. So it's an amazing thing. Each and every one of us, you and me and whoever's listening and every Jew in the world and every human being in the world, he never does the same thing two times. Each of us is unique. Each of us has a unique fingerprint. Each of us has a unique face. Chazal say that the face, panim, is reflective of the panim, which is the inside. These two things mean two contradictory things on the surface. Panim is what we show the outside, but the face reflects the inside of a person very deeply. And so the panim reflects the panim. Chazal say, Kashem she partzufeyem enam shabbos. The same way that their countenances, that the way that we look is, is different. Kach be'oseyem enam shabbos. So too, our consciousness is the way that we perceive the world, our own unique approach, our own unique energy, our own unique angle, our own unique insight. It's not, it's not, it's not the same. Each and every person is different. And something important to keep in mind and remember is that as the tzaddikim teach, there's a fundamental distinction between a bar and a be'er, which literally translated bar and be'er means it means a, um, a bar is a pit and a be'er Oh, there you go. And a be'er is a uh, is a spring, bar and a be'er. What's the difference between these two? So it's very simple. A bar, what that means, a pit, means that you need to come and fill it with something, usually water, and then it's there. It's holding the water in this kli, in this vessel, in this vestibule, and then you're able to come and draw water out of it. But you have to put water in there. 
but a be'er is a source of water. It's nothing that needs to be filled. It springs, kachuta, like Galatians, spring. It springs forth on its own, constantly giving, giving forth water. Amazing thing. Bar and be'er. Says Rinach, says that the tzaddik, my soul, Rebbein Sasson, brings this down. What's the difference between bar and be'er? That the bar is just a vessel and a be'er is a source. He says, so many of us think that we are a bechin, an aspect of a bar, which means that we're essentially vessels. We could contain a great deal of information and insight, but we're always waiting for someone else to come and to fill us up. And there's truth to that, of course. We need to learn from the Svar Maktashim. We need to learn from all of our Messiah, Tarish of Iksav, Tarish of Alpeh. We have Rabbe and we have guides, we have teachers. And a Hanami, there's a very strong aspect in which we need to be filled. But he says the truth is that beyond all of this, each and every Jewish soul is a be'er, it's a spring. There's a unique insight that our neshamas have to share that needs to come from a place beyond which anything that we're getting from the outside could reach. It needs to be something that mamish comes from our pnim, reflected in our panim. It needs to be our own unique Derech, our own unique, what we refer to in the book and the story of our lives as the Shvil Manatzat, our own chapter five, our own unique path to the side. And it's narrow. It's not a highway. It's not the path that everybody walks on. It's just my own little path. My own little path. Ner elikim nishmas adam, just this little candle that we're using to light our own way our own way, with our own language and with our own approach. And of course, it has to go hand in hand with everything that we're receiving from the outside. But we have to tap into that place within that's mamish the be'er. That's mamish the be'er without getting into the depth of it now. But basically, the difference semantically on a word level between bar and be'er is that the bar has a vav in the middle and be'er has an aleph in the middle. One and six is, of course, the six days of the week. And Shabbos. Shabbos, we know, is the Mekar HaBracha. That's Mamash, the source of the blessing that flows like a spring that flows into the six days of the week. And so Bar has a Vav inside because that represents the aspect in which the six days of the week are receiving their Bracha from without, from outside of itself, essentially. It's just a Kli. But Be'er has an Aleph in it to, to symbolize it, to hint, and to to, to, to express and communicate that Shabbos is the Shoirish. It's just that one special day where we say, right, by Minchan and Shabbos, we say, Ata echod, v'shimcha echod, goy echad It's that one unified revelation from beyond where we are bound together with Hashem, who is, of course, the Shoirish Hakol, the Ein Sof, who is bound together with the Torah, of course which contains within it 600,000 letters of which each and every one of us are formed with which each and every one of us are bound. And so therefore it's the Shabbistic aspect of Echad that's implanted within the word Be'er to tell us that like Shabbos, we who are the Ben Zug and the spouse of Shabbos, we who are so entirely rooted in the sphere of Malchus and that place of being Mamluch Hashem in his world that he created, we're the nation that stands up and through thick and thin, we unequivocally are witnesses to the world that there's one God, unbelievable, there's one God. And through all the challenge and through all the struggle, much of which we read about yesterday on Tisha B'Av, how much we've been kicked around, we never fell into the mistake of duality or denying a God altogether. We've held strong, and our parents and our grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents before them held strong. And that's a remarkable thing. We have to realize that's a remarkable thing. So this is the element of Shabbos, of Malchus, of Echad, Ata Echad Bishim Chachad. This is the Aleph in the word Be'er. We have that spring within ourselves, nothing we need to earn. It's nothing we need to get from the outside. We need to absorb like a sponge all of the Torah that's coming at us, all the Hashkafa, all the... MS that's coming at us from the Messiah. And then we need to tap very deeply into our own approach to it, meaning our own unique lens through which we're able to view everything else. And that way, the bar and the be'er come together in the most wonderful, sweet, beautiful form. 
the bar and the be'er, so that Shabbos can flow into the six days of the week. Al kol panim, this is what Rabbi Nachman is saying over here. Hashem is barach, enoi oise shnei pa'amim davar echad. Hashem never does the same thing twice. And if you made me and you made you, that's two different things. Even though Bashirish, Bashirish, Ba'amkas were the same, Hashem needs that we should all be different facets of one diamond, refracting the light in a slightly different way as you turn the diamond around in the candlelight. And here the Rebbe says an amazing thing, and something that I believe is a misconception, and we're going to learn from the Arizal in a minute, where the Ari in Shara Gilgulim itself clears this up. But the Rebbe says, Ki a lot of people think, ah, okay, we know certain things. This one was a Gilgal of that one, right? And a lot of it is, is, is brought down in Shara Gugul, and we're going to learn over here that the Neshama of Eliyahu Navi contained within it the Neshamas of Nadav and Aviyu, and Moshe Rabbeinu, the Arizal says, is a Gilgal of Noyach, all these different kinds of things that we speak about, and then certainly later on in history, um, we refer to the Nishamas of Rabbi Nachman, for example, and the Nishama of Rabbi Shimon Yochai being exceedingly connected without getting into that parsha right now. So a lot of people think, and it's, it's, I mean, it's a common mistake and it's understandable, that it's literally the same Nishama, meaning the Nishama that was in Noyach comes down and becomes the Nishama of Moshe Rabbeinu. And it's Nisaber, it, it, it comes, it, it impregnates, so to speak, the Nishama of whoever it is that it is being this galgal within, that it is being reincarnated within. But says Rabbi Nachman, that's not, the, that's not the case. It's not that the whole entirety of Noah's neshama came down and became the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu in a later iteration throughout history. Famously, Darizal says that in Moshe Rabbeinu's famed declaration of humility and leadership, where he says, if you're not going to forgive Am Yisrael, the im'ayin mecheni namni sifracha, wipe me out of your book. Meaning to say my whole, meaning Moshe Rabbeinu's whole essence was to lead and to protect and to nurture and to guide and to defend Am Yisrael. Says the Arizal, mecheni is the same letters as me Noah, the waters of Noah. And so there you see that Noah and, and Moshe Rabbeinu have a very deep connection. And he explains that what Noah failed to do in protecting and defending his generation, davening for them, believing in them, Moshe Rabbeinu was misakin. Because again, Ari says that the entire Dar Hamabal, believe it or not, was actually misgalga, was reincarnated as the generation that left Mitzrayim. Unbelievable thing. So it's all the same story. It's all the same story again and again. And I told my wife over dinner last night after a Tisha B'Av where year after year in the afternoon, I tried to descend into that place of, of, of Nazi Germany, of the Holocaust. Um, to reflect on that, it's not something that I can easily do any other time throughout the year. I grew up you know, with uh, two sets of grandparents who survived the war and, and really under the, the, the elongated shadow of Auschwitz. And so it's, a, it's extremely painful and to any sensitive soul to try to deal with and confront and face the magnitude of that monstrosity and of that tragedy doesn't do any kind of justice to something that's completely beyond justice in any, in any, in any sense of any word um, is too painful the rest of the year. But on, on Tisha B'Av, so that's what I'm watching all these uh, you know, Holocaust documentaries and, and really feeling it, really, really feeling it, really feeling it. And about two generations of my grandparents were, were killed in Auschwitz, Hungarian Jews between 40, 44 and 45. Hashem in Kamdamam. So later when I was reflecting on it, in addition to a lot of other reflections, but I mentioned to my wife that it, it seems so clear to me that this generation is, is the six million come to life. And it's not, it's not my chiddush. I think that somebody actually published a book recently about that, where people have reported many people, not, not just like one or two, many people have reported um, having flashbacks, memories, almost conscious memories from, from a previous time where they never experienced those places or those people or those experiences or those circumstances. And um, it seems clear that the generation that's now coming back to Eretz Yisrael, and as much as we're about to leave in a couple of weeks to London, which is also part and parcel of, like Rabbi Nachman says, wherever I walk, I'm walking to Eretz Yisrael to spread Eretz Yisrael consciousness and hopefully come back with many Jews in tow, the Siat Rishmai, it's a bit of a mission, more than, uh, you know, moving out or, or a Yerida of any, of any, of any sort. Um, but this generation, Bechalal, it's moving into an Eretz Yisrael consciousness where the six million come to life. I mean, that seems so obvious to me. 
And it's just a heritage that I have. So nothing's ever lost. And who knows who that generation was? So it's not as if, oh, the, the, you know, there have been billions and billions and billions, maybe trillions of people, you know, constantly filling the world, fathers and sons and grandsons and great grandsons and sons and fathers and fathers and children and daughters. No, it, it's just essentially the same souls that are just revisiting. The world is a lot, you know, people say, oh, it's a small world. It really is a much smaller world than you think. Because who in heaven's name knows? Well, in heaven's name, only, only Ata Echad Vashimcha, that heaven and his name know. But everybody else, you know, we have no, we're not privy to any kind of information with regard to even us, this little group. Who knows how many times we met before? Not over Zoom, probably, but in other meetings, in other places, in other lifetimes. It, you know, like Roshul Makabach used to say, he said, it's not that they invented airplanes. And so we're able to meet so many more people. He says, we need before the coming of Mashiach to meet so many more people. So Hashem made that they should have meant airplanes, right? It, we, we need to meet, we need to be misakin, we need to fix up. And we have no, we have no, can't fathom this. But ordinarily, again, we think that it's just, this is Nesgalgal into this, says Rabbi Nachman, it's not so. He says, Rak the Right, each soul contains five parts. There's nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yichida, five levels of the soul. And so Rabbi Nachman says, each time that there's a new Gilgal, so to speak, that that neshama comes down, it's not the whole entirety of the neshama filling a new body, but Hashem mixes and matches, so to speak, different neshamas with different ruchas. We have no conception of, 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 of what's going on. We have no conception of anything ever. But certainly in this regard, outside of what Arizal reveals to us and what the tzaddikim have told us, it's completely unfathomable, this whole process. That's really the secret to why things happen, Bechlau, and what is happening, and what our choices are, and what's the, what's the bigger story, what's the bigger picture. It's, it's one day we'll find out, but life is, is, is far more complex than we think, like far more. We have no idea who we are, who you are, what we're doing here, what we're accomplishing. And, and, and so the Rebbe says it's more complex. It's different parts of different souls being put with different parts of different souls, each time in a new iteration, because like the first line says, Hashem Yisbarach, Einoy Oysa Shnei Pa'amim Davar Echad. Rebbe HaKadosh Baruch Hu never does the same thing twice. Nimsa says, Rebbe Nachman, we find, Sha'achshav, now, Kishizah Nefesh Meskabitz and Ruach Achra Vechiyotza Bezeh, Shuv Ein Zeh Masha Hoya Koyit. So now, it's not like it was before. Now, when it's put together, it's different. It's a new, it's a new uh, recipe, so to speak. You use that terminology, so it's a different cake. It's something else. It's different ingredients that are put together to create this thing that's not essentially new because all of its chalakim, all of its parts have already existed, but now in this formulation, it's something brand new, something brand new. Him, so we find ah so that's right so shuv ein zemashe hayokaidim it's not it's not the same thing he ain't Hashem is baruch oisa shnei pa'amim davar echad because a kadosh baruch who doesn't do the same thing twice the world is hamach like we say hamachadish b'tuvay bechol yoyim tamid ma'aseh bereishis Hashem is constantly constantly recreating every particle of physicality anew and it's different and it's fresh and that's how we can tap into the spirit of renewal if we're going to adapt to this consciousness and realize it's not the same tree that you saw yesterday. It's not the same plants that you walked by. It's not the same person that you thought that you met. Everybody's new, everything's fresh all the time and nothing's old, nothing's stale, nothing was created and then allowed to exist. Everything is fresh all the time, all the time. Let's take a look at Shara Gogulim from the Ariya Kadesh, which the Pirish on Sichas Ram that I'm using, Noyama Sichas brings down. And he says, Da, you should know, very important hakdama to the whole Sefer. Ki afal pishetim tzakas of itzlinim and makoim is rabim, ki ployinim is galgo bapliny, like we said. That a lot of times in that Rizal, specifically in Shara Gulgulim, you'll find that this one became this one, like we said before, Noyach became Moshe, or whatever the, 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 the paradigm is, right? Pinchas became Aliyahu, whatever it is. Ba'achikach bapliny, the first he was reincarnated into this one and then into that one. Al tis sit eloimar. Don't be mistaken to think kiana shama hari shoyna atzma that the soul itself kiamas galgalas tam. It is it's constantly just coming down again and again and again and again. Al the inin who that's not what's happening. What's actually happening? He says is kiene kama shor shem le'in kates neschalku neshamas bnei adam. Right? He says each soul 
is split into many, many, many different parts. We spoke before about nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechida, right? That those are five basic categories, but that result and the tzaddikim explain that the neshama, which is one of five, contains the five. So there's neshama of neshama, there's ruach of neshama, uh, there, right? There's, uh, let's start from the top, there's yechida of neshama, there's chai of neshama, there's, there's neshama of neshama, there's ruach of neshama, there's nefesh of neshama, and each of those five contain five, and so on and so forth. It's not, it cannot be that if the physical reality that we experience within and that we apprehend without, and we, we, we encounter and experience without in the world outside of us is so complex, but the spiritual foundation is so simple. It can't be, it cannot be. Think about how complex the eye is, how complex the heart is, different body parts. Well, we know that in general, so the eyes are connected to chachma, let's say, right? But hold on one second, there are many, many different parts of the eye. And that's just on a, on a visible level, then on a molecular level, on an anatomical level, you go deeper. So there's, there, it must be that the spiritual blueprint is equally complex. And that's exactly true. That's how it works. We're, we, everybody knows we, we learn about the seven lower spheres. Okay, but each of those seven spheres has seven. We know that from, we know that from the days of sphere themselves, right? Because there are seven weeks and there are seven days in each of the weeks. So even in sphere, we know there's chesed shebe chesed, and then there's gvur shebe chesed, and tifer shebe chesed, and so on and so forth. But Chazal used the terminology miot rabim shtayim. Whenever you want to refer to an infinite amount, but akoponim, you have to speak of two, right? Because in Hebrew, once you add a yud and a mem at the end of a word. So now it could be an infinite amount. Rabim means masses, not just two. It means an infinite number. Once you say yud and mem at the end, so then it includes everything. And it's the same exact thing with the spheres. It's infinite ad in self. It's impossible for us to, to comprehend. So we operate, you know, in terms of our simple learning, al pichasidas, we operate on a very, very, very zoomed out, like basic, you know, entry level, so to speak. But it's very complex, very, very, very deep. And so each neshama that's split into nefesh, ruach, neshama, chay, nechida, these five, are split into endless numbers of spiritual sparks. Ki he says, le'en kates. There's an infinite amount of spiritual ingredients within each and every part of our souls. This chalku neshama is b'nei adam. That's how the souls are divided. U'b'sharish echamehem, and in each of those shorashim, in each of those roots, each of those sparks has an infinite number of, of sparks of different souls that Hashem is able to keep track of. And if you can keep start, <laughs> track of the stars in the, in, the, in, the, in the galaxies, you can keep track also, you know, certainly of, of everything, of all the different shards, of all the different souls, and, and they're tikkunim, unbelievable. And every time there's a new reincarnation, so it's fixed a little portion of some of those sparks. And all those sparks that were not yet rectified in this Gilgal, so they become divided again, along with many other sparks from many other different kinds of souls. And it comes down again. Those parts that were fixed, which is hopefully a large portion of our identities as Torah Jews that are yearning, that are growing, that are striving, that are open. Bezer Hashem, you know, great, a great amount of our souls are being mitukan through everything that we go through with the moon and we hold on and we fight for it and we battle for it. And, and, and Baruch Hashem, we're the cream of the crop, we're, 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 we're our Kurdish Baruch Hu's pride and joy, each of us. So he says, they don't come back down. Ein amnam, rather, oilim va'imdim madriga ru'ilhem. That's it. That's it. So when the Pasuk says, noyach ish tzadik, and the Torah itself gives testimony on Noach that he was a tzaddik, even though Chazal say, but on a simple reading level, Noach was righteous, right? So whatever part of Noach came down into Moshe means doesn't mean that Noach himself needed to be reincarnated. Noach has his place. Noach is tzaddik. Noach is connected to Shabbos. Or Nachman speaks about Noach in incredible terms. He comes down into, into, into Moshe some sparks of that soul, whatever that is that needs to be fixed. But... It's not what we usually think. And he says, once we're on the topic, he says, Was that an amazing thing? He says, now you can understand what I've described to you and explained to you. Regarding Aaron's sons, Aaron Akayan's two sons, 
Nadav and Aviu, who famously brought in what the Torah refers to as an Eish Zara on the inauguration day into the Mishkan, and a fire came down and consumed them, the Kroibaya Kadesh. And we've, Narizal says that previous to this piece, which is Hakdam Yudalad in Shar Gugulim, Narizal has explained, they've come down a number of times. It came into Pinchas, Pinchas became Elio, and then as we're going to learn, it came down to Elisha, who is Elio's primary Talmud. That Elisha Davins, or Elisha requests from Elio, that when Elio Anavi is going up to Shemaim in a chariot of fire, that a double portion of his soul should come down into Elisha's soul. What's the double portion? Pishnaim. What do you mean, two, a double portion? Says the Arizal, Nadav and Aviu is the Pishnaim. Pishnaim Bruchachelai, that there should be two. And of course, Vayihi Na Pishnaim, the word Na is Rosh Tevis. <coughs> Excuse me, Nadav and Aviu. Na is the is the is is itself the Pishnaim. By Yehi, Na, Nadav and Aviu, Pishnaim, Bruchachai. When Elio's Ruach comes down into Elisha, Rabbi Nachman is a tire about the Star Samachvav, the 66th lesson in the Kutamaran. So Narizal explains, Kinadav Aviu, Hoya Betchila Belio. First, whatever, again, whatever part they need to be into Khan, because we have to understand that they were tremendous Sadiqim and all the Svarim explain what it was exactly that they did, what they did wrong, what they did right. It's brought that in Rashi. Rashi brings that Moshe says, Now I see that Nadav and Aviu were even greater than us. Because the Pasik said, Bekroi Vaya Kadesh, those that are close to me will be sanctified in such a way. And Moshe Aaron says, I knew someone would die. I thought it would be us, but it was them. So we have to understand they were on a tremendous madriga. What does that mean? That they were this galgal, they were had to come down as a new Gilgal again and again and again, three times, however many times. How could that be? So again, based on what we're saying, it, it's just parts. Right, so he says over here, not that I'm you, how you zal. First, they were in Elio, Zafra, the Rachel, Acha, Kacha, Elisha. Then they came down to Elisha, Mobad, Kama, Gugul, and aside from many other times that they were reincarnated. So he says, what does this mean? Okay, there's a little lengthy, I'll read it in a minute. Thank you for sharing, though. So he says, like this. So he says, the truth is, Nadav and Avi themselves are from the Sherish of one kind of soul. And then, bound to the Shoresh, that is within Nadav and Aviyu, are countless shards and sparks of different souls. And then, every time it, this soul, so to speak, that was split into Nadav and Aviyu, that itself, is composed of many shards of many different souls from previous generations or within their generation. So those sparks become fixed every time they come down again. And those sparks that were not yet rectified, Elisha rather these were the, uh, the, the, the soul shards that Elisha was requesting become included within his neshama so that through his avoda he could give them their final tikkun and that's what he said by he na zorash tevis nadav and aviu pishnayim beruchacha elai in the unified ruach of elio should come down into elisha and he says over here ki oisim shiniskenu oi alu bemadriga samarela because whatever was fixed whether it was not even aviu's original sparks or whether it was that whatever sparks were included in those holy souls they went up to their place. They did not come down again. Now Elisha was two aspects. Really, Elisha was connected to Yosef Atzadik. Really, they were rooted in Cain, Cain and Hevel, that were then became into the Neshamas of Nadav and Aviyu to have their ticket over there. Really, Elisha had these two aspects, Yosef at Sadiq and also Kayim, and Kayim being the Shirish for those Nishamas of Nadav Naviu. And this Arizal explains, reveals an incredible soul, a secret, a mystery of why Elisha's name was Elisha. Lahaira is to teach this very lesson that he had a relationship on a soul level with Kayim. Because by Kayim, the Pasuk says, that that Hashem turned to the carbon, to the offering of Hevel, 
but not to the offering of Kayan. That's what it means. God did not turn. Lo sha'a. Sha'a can mean an hour, but it could also mean to turn. Uvelisha miskan chetay shal Kayan. But Elisha at Sadik, Elisha fixed up the sin of Kayan. And that's why he's called Nikra Elisha, because Ki HaKadosh Baruch Hu Sha'aloi B'Kabloi. Because to him, Hashem did indeed turn. But Oisio is Loi Sha'a. And if you take the letters, Loi Sha'a, did not turn. Nehepchu V'Netu Eilai Sha'a. Eilai Sha'a. Not Loi Sha'a, but Eilai Sha'a. He has turned to me. And when you put those two words together, Eli Sha'a, you get the word Elisha. Eli Sha'a. That's the fixing of Kayin, that El Kayin of El Menchase, Loisha, Eli Sha'a. That fixes up that sin of Kayin, which ultimately is also related, as the Rizal explains, to the Chait of Nadav and Avi, not to the Chait, but to the experience and to the episode of Nadav and Avi, that comes down into Eliyahu and then comes down by Yina Pishnaim, Na, Nadav and Avi, Pishnaim down into Elisha, where it becomes Eli Sha'a. Amazing. Because he had already had some relationship with that sole source of Kayin to begin with. See, so he wanted now that whatever was left in the soul of Elio Anavi should now come down into him as well. The Yishabri Imai become down to his own soul. Like we already said, that he should experience that. Double portion, no, no, and a view, Vizachalam, and he indeed merited them. Machmas Oitsenitza shall Kayin, shall be with Gila Kiniska, because he had already had their meaning, no, and a view's root soul in Kayin, and so, like a magnet, it was able to draw those other sparks to it. Umizet Hakish Vitam the whole Hagel Gulam Shaba Oilman. Arizal says this is very important to understand about all secrets of reincarnation. Ki ain Harishainim Mamish Oisa Mamis Galgalim. Do not think. That when we refer to somebody that came down as a Gilgal, it means the whole entirety of that soul came down to the world again. Can't be. Because, that, because what about Gan Eden? And what about, what about Schar? And what about, you know, having, having attained and achieved their rightful place in the world to come? We don't say that. Hashem has this whole plan. It's very delicate and it's very multifaceted. Just whatever soul sparks, again, whatever this means, I certainly don't know, but whatever soul sparks were not rectified first, they come down again. And that's what Ibn Achman is referring to over here, right? It's not that soul itself. He speaks more generally, but each of those are split into many, 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 many different kinds of spiritual aspects. And Hashem is running this incredible symphony that one day we'll be privy to. And we'll see the other side of the curtain. But what the takeaway is, at least for me from this sicha, is that Hashem is barach eina oisah shnei pa'amid davar echad. Two takeaways. Number one, each and every one of us is different. And it means that through the be'er of our neshamas being bound with Shabbos, ata echad v'shimcha echad, being the makar habracha, we are able to dig, dig deep down, maybe even deep down beyond the pit, part of us that needs to accept from outside. That's the aspect of the six days of the week or the six sons in the story of the lost princess, but to dig down to unearth the be'er. Believe that you have a be'er within you. You have something unique to share to the world. And it will be in whatever framework, whatever capacity, whether it's as a mother or it's as a father or it's as a friend or it's in whatever position at the workplace or in your community or whatever it is, but it's got to be you. It's got to be soul. It's got to be mamish, your own root soul, your own neshama. And that means that each of us have our own angle. And that's what's the beauty of Am Yisrael. It's called Tiferes Yisrael. Am Yisrael are called Tiferes. Tiferes is, it's got to be a blend of a great many things. Tiferes is harmony. Tiferes is the mix between chesed and gvura. And that's the, that's the beauty, the splendor of Am Yisrael is that there's no, there's no um, homogenous, you know, kind of, 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 of group think in terms of our, um, our, our uniformity. Of course, we have that aspect of our essential unity and we have, you know, our, our 
um, our shared and collective inheritance without a question. But while we are all in one Torah, because that's where our neshamas are rooted, or at least the root souls of these 600,000 that keep on coming back in different iterations, different forms, different permutations again and again. So we're all rooted in those 600,000 letters of one Torah, but each of us is a different letter. And we have to believe that from that place within ourselves, like your cook writes, we have to find that letter. That's our gate. That's our thing. That's our connection. However, that manifests in our unique nature and our unique talents and our, and our unique personalities and our unique circumstances and our unique uh, situation, our past, our present, our future, to bring, to bring all of that with us and to utilize that as the framework within which our unique neshamas can emerge to then illuminate everything that we're receiving from our Messiah in the most beautiful way, like Rabbi Nachman himself did, when the tzaddik said, hold my hand and I'll take you on a new path that's really just the old path. But on Rabbi Nachman's lips, all of the Torah that we've been hearing from the tzaddikim for thousands of years, it was different. So that Rabbi Nachman said, Chiddush There was no such Chiddush like, like Rabbi Nachman. Whoa, what's, it's a different religion? So what, what, what is it? Or how is it so new? I'm saying it's Yiddish, God, it's Judaism. It's true. But Rabbi Nachman believed enough in the error of his neshama to go ahead and to engage with all of the same ideas that everybody else had been talking about. But it was, it was a fresh approach. It was a fresh angle. It was a fresh facet. It was a fresh melody that's played on the same keyboard with all the keys that everybody else has. But it's just, it's, it's, it's played differently in different combinations so that the melody is completely different. It's the same piano. It's the same Torah. But when you click on the different keys in different combinations, in different ways, in a different order, in different varying levels of intensity, so the sound is completely and entirely different, the melody is different, and naturally the dance is different. And we were sent to the world to make people dance, right? Whether practically, but I mean metaphorically, to be able to bring people to life, to be able to give, breathe, to breathe life into other people. And the way that we do that is by believing in, accessing, and bringing out that inner melody, that inner be'er, to fill the bar in other people, the bar within ourselves, but in a very unique way, in a very natural way, in a very uh, individualistic way, while still maintaining our bond with the whole. That's super important. And so that's one thing I take away from here. Hashem doesn't do the same thing twice. You could see two people, they look exactly the same. They're twins, and they come from the same family in the same circumstances. No, Hashem doesn't do the same thing two times. It's different. And the second thing that you learn here is about ischachas, is about renewal. Renewal. HaKadosh Baruch Hu and sameness cannot go hand in hand. Hashem is dynamic. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, even though we say, Ani Hashem, nisi, Hashem doesn't change, but what of that doesn't change? The renewal aspect of it doesn't change. Meaning Hashem is new every second. It's the same Hashem all the time. But the energy, the creativity is pulsating. Every second of every day, all the letters, like the Rizal explains, is brought down by the Nefshe Chaim. It's called the Ralash the 231 gates of all the different permutations of all the letters. Everything is, everything is new. Every minute is new. Every second is fresh. And so it's really a new reality. Every moment. We get to tap into this moment, like we spoke about last time. You, we enter into a universe of newness, a universe of freshness, a fresh beginning, a fresh start, a fresh ability to start tapping into that inner voice, believing in it, empowering it, bringing it out into the world. So it's a short sicha, but it's a, it's a, it's a powerful and an, and an important one. Let's take a look at Sicha Saran Nun Hei. This is a very beautiful Sicha. Rav Nassim records, Pam Achaz Diber Me'inyan Tuv Ha'olam Haba. One time, Rabbi Nachman spoke about the goodness of the world to come. And here so beautifully, he says, because it can mean two things, right? What does it mean on a simple level? What a person can merit to through true service of God. So on a simple level, that would mean there's this place called Olam Haba sometime in the future. And whatever a person can attain through his Avar Hashem, so that we get a bunch of checks and we get a bunch of points or whatever the system is. And then after 120 or after Mashiach comes, then we get our reward, the Yom Shekuli Aruch. But 
to a person that has more of a background in Rabbi Nachman's teachings, that knows that in Lukut Maran, Rabbi Nachman constantly, constantly speaks about a ge'ula pratita, a personal redemption, and the way in which Rabbi Nachman, as the Torah says, Gan Eden and Gehenim are bezeh mamish. They are in this world, in a certain sense. They are in this world, Rabbi Nachman, the Torah, nun, in, I'm sorry, in Torah, in Torah, in Torah, hey, I believe in Torah, Dalit or hey, Rabbi Nachman says, Schar mitzvah is the mitzvah itself, and the person should relinquish all hope for some olam haba in the future, but just enjoy the mitzvah itself. That's olam haba. You can read it completely differently. Rabbi Nachman spoke about the beauty and the goodness of the world to come, but it's not a world that we're going to experience at some point in the future. It's the world to come that we taste through our Avadis Hashem, not that when we serve God properly, then one day we'll get Olam Abba. No, like literally through the service of God, ah, you can taste such sweetness, such goodness. Rabbi Nachman also says, I believe it either it's in the Kutumran or Chaimran, he said, or it's, or it's in Sichusran, right? Now I can't even remember anymore. He says, He says, the, 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 the world to come that a person can taste in this world, Lafavim, in the Shires, unimaginable, right? So you find again and again this terminology of Nassim says, about Rabbi Nachman, he says, my Mashiach already came, right? I didn't believe that Rabbi Nachman was a messianic figure like Mashiach Mamish to redeem the whole world. That wasn't, that wasn't, but he felt that on a personal level, in terms of breaking out of an exile mentality, the constricted kind of way of looking at the world, so I'm already out, right? So he's already tasting that Olam Haba still in this world. And this is what many of the Svarim say. We have to explain how the bracha that was given to Yaakov Avinu was different than the bracha that was given to Esau. Both of them seem to be very, very similar, right? They both seem to be talking about financial plenty, about, about, uh, about, about sustenance, abundance, right? Of this worldly kind of, kind of experience. So how are they different? So many of the tzaddikim explain that the difference is as follows. What was given to Esau was Olam Hazeh itself. Olam Hazeh was given to Esau, this world. What was given to Yaakov Avinu was the Olam Haba within Olam Hazeh. The Olam Haba within Olam Hazeh. And my Sefer Sunlight of Redemption on, on the first Torah and the Kutumran. So we speak a lot over there about the idea of the Dalid and the Yud, which come together to form a hay. Right, the form of the Dalit, or like this, and then the little yud, like the leg of the hay. It's a Dalit and a yud. Yoimar la ilamai die. Right, you'd say to this world, die, die. Enough. This world was created by Hashem saying, die. Misha amar la die. That's why we say ta, this this terminology of shakai. Right, is the word the one that said shamar die. Dalit and yud, but that becomes a hay. So the pasuk says, ki Hashem We've likely mentioned this before, but it's a good time to say again. Good tired to have in your pocket. Kibaka Hashem Surilamim Hashem created worlds with ka. Says the Gemara, what's ka? Is a yud and a hey. What are the worlds? Say Chazal, Hashem created Olam Haba with the yud. And Hashem created Olam Hazel with the hey. So I wanted to suggest that maybe it's not so. Maybe Hashem created Olam Haba with the yud. And he created Olam Hazel with a dalid. Because dalid is the Aramaic word delays, which in the Zohar Kaddish comes in the sentence of delays lamigame klum, a reference to the sphere of Malchus, which becomes our physical world in a very lowly iteration, Malchus or Malchus of Asiya, of Asiya on a very low level. But that is connected to the concept of Dalit, delays lamigame klum, which then becomes the four Malchuyas, the Sitra'acha, right? The four Galuyas that we're experiencing on the four different kinds of nations of empires <clears throat> are also related to Malchus. That's connected to the concept of four because it's rooted in the word delays. It doesn't have anything of its own. It's just physicality. It needs spirituality to bring it to life, like a soul to a body. And that word delays, which means it does not have, becomes dalit. Dalit is delays, the same letter, delays. And so this world, really, I want to say, is created with a dalit, not with a hey. Olam haba is with a yud. Olam hazeh is with a dalit. Ay, but Chazal say, kibikha, with yud and a hey. So olam hazeh is this world. No, so I want to say this is the dalit of Asa. And Asa was given just the physicality of the world, the externality of the world, that part of the world that's the less lamagami klum. It's just nothing on its own. But then there's the Olam Haba of the Yud, the Yud of Olam Haba, 
that comes into the Dalit, and that becomes the hay. And that's the privilege of Am Yisrael that are able to look beyond the facade of the Dalit and to find the Yud within it so that we perceive the world as a hay mamish, a hay, the last hay of Yud Kevavke, because we're able to look beyond the physicality of the world and we're able to find and determine that there's an Olam Haba embedded within Olam Azeh, the bracha of Yaakov Avinu that's to be found within the bracha of Esau. And so I want to read this sentence that way. Pam Achas one time, Diber Mi'inin Tu Olam Haba. Rabbi Nachman spoke about the goodness of Olam Haba, or kind. That we can tap into in this world already. Anava Amar, Rabbi Nachman announced and he said, Listen how beautiful this is. He says, He says, we, we have to call it good. We have to call it good. Because the human language does not have any other word to refer to this kind of experience other than tov. Right? That, that's the word that we use for something that's, that's just essentially good. With all the connotations of what good means. But only for the purpose of l'hoidil of ne'adam. Just to try to describe it to other people, what this feeling is, it's, it's got to be good. I mean, there's no other word to say. You just got to say, wow, that was, that was really good. And Yiddishkeit is really good. And our mitzvahs are really good. And serving Hashem with openness and honesty and humility is really tov. It's really good. Rabbi Nachman says the truth is, To limit it to this word good or tov, it's limitation. It's not what it is. This is much better than toy. This is much better than anything that the word good can attempt to communicate, which for anybody who's been with us from the very beginning, I wonder if any of the chevra are, are still holding on. Mamish from the first sicha, that would be incredible. Let me know either personally or over here or wherever, if you're holding on Mamish every year from the beginning, what a privilege. But the very first sicha, was really something like this, where the Rebbe says in Sicha Aleph, already up to Sicha Nun Hey, Chaz Di Hashem, what a privilege to learn all this with you. But in Sicha Aleph, the Rebbe says, Ki ani adati ki gadol Hashem. Where Davon Amalek says, I know that God is great. What do you mean you know? Nobody else knows? This also correlates to what we learned in Nun Dalet, that each and every one of us have our own perceptions. Rabbi Nachman says, it's EF sure. our experience of Hashem and the experience of divinity that comes down into each of our own lives. It's impossible to say to somebody else, just in there's no words for it. It's impossible to say. EF Shaloimar. So this is something similar because we learned then also that it doesn't just mean that we can't find the words for it. We learned that there are no words for it. It is beyond language. Like we say, even though we mean something different, I'll peep shot when we say, we say, God, on a literal level, it means you've lifted me above all the nations of the world, all the other languages. But I once heard a shot from my Rebbe or small Brazil, where I learned by that it means something much deeper. The Roy Mantanu, master of heaven and earth, the way that you've elevated Amnisrael above all the nations, it's Mikol Halashainus. It's impossible to use words to, to, to express that because anything's going to be too constricted. Right? Gewalt, unbelievable. Ah, the rabbits in Shalom, it's been here from the beginning. Amazing, amazing. Mamish, amazing. What a privilege. Thank you. And that's something similar to what the Rebbe is saying over here. So you got to use the word toy. To say that, oh, that's what it is. Oh, it's good. Like in order, in, 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 in terms of our conception of like other things that are good, like I had a good steak last night, right? And then, okay, I had a good spiritual experience. It was really good. It was really great. Uh, it's the end of I mean, you can't use the same term. But so what are we supposed to do? Right? Okay. Maybe sometimes, like we say, to Hashem, silence is praise, right? Because we don't have any words for it. But if you need to communicate it, we have to use these words, but to be aware, it's much, much greater than anything that words could express. Words are essentially limited when it comes to speaking about that which is beyond articulation. It's, it's, it's much better than anything that the word good can capture. Right? He says, what, 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 what can you do? I mean, you have to use some words, and so we say good. But don't be fooled. And to remind ourselves all the time, what we've 
truly experienced. There are no words for it. I bless us all to have that experience in Yiddishkeit, where we know that there's, there's no way that we could explain it. There's no way that we could describe it. doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Right? That we're supposed to we're supposed to go ahead and to mamish, you know, different sukim. We're supposed to try to communicate what we feel to others. Maybe this is an eitza. Right? Describe it as undescribable. Explain it as ineffable that I'm just not able to talk about it. Sometimes more takes away, right? To fast the fast. If you try to grab too much, so sometimes it's just better to just leave it. You could say it's good, but it's that's just because that's the words that I have at my disposal. But it's it's far deeper than that. Tamu uru kitoyv Hashem. The pasuk says, "Taste and you'll see that God is good." Toyv Hashem call God is good. Right? Tamu. It's just something that needs to be tasted. And we learned, I think, actually in the shir, the very first shir that we learned from Reb Tzaddik, if I'm not mistaken, that Reb Tzaddik says, daiko, the word tamu is used because of taste. Each person has a different, how do you know that the taste is something so subjective? One per person has more sensitivity to salt. So he tastes the salt, you know, much stronger. So somebody has a different uh, sensitivity. Different people have different tastes. Like they say, different, they have different tastes in clothing, a different, a different, which means a different style, but it's unique to them. Tamu uru, each Jew has his own taste. Of Yiddishkeit. We're all tasty. It's the same thing, but we each have our different taste, which of course goes back to what we said before about each of us being a bit error, each of us having our own approach, which is perhaps the link between Nundalid and Nunhei Abel the Emes. But in truth, the Pasik says, I No eye has seen it. No words can describe it. It's just something you feel, and not everything you feel needs to be communicated. On the contrary, sometimes holding it in is something very, very deep. Something very deep, because we know that it can never be expressed anyway. So what's the purpose? Let's finish up the last few minutes with Sichas Ran Nun Vav. And the Rebbe says something that, okay, a little bit, you know, in the Jewish calendar, right after Av, we start moving into Elul already. So this is a little bit more El-like in its tone, <clears throat> in its conception. It's a little bit, it's a little bit, strong you have to make yourself strong to hear this as do i but let's try to let's try to learn together what well, this will come to an end for tonight it says Rabbi Nachman, Adam, there are some people it might look to them like they're very distant from certain negative traits or desires as a person thinks i just don't i don't have an affinity for money i I don't, I don't understand people that are constantly running after more and more and more and that need another car and another house and another this and another that and buying fancy things and taking fancy. I don't, I just don't have that taiva. A person could, and a person could pride themselves over this. Says Ibn Ahmed, not so fast. Da, you should know. She afal pikein, even though you feel or I feel that I might be distant from a certain kind of engagement with the ashelia with the delusion or the illusion of this worldliness. What do we know? It could be that we're worse off than the person that we're judging because we think that they're involved in a taiva that we we broke that taiva, right? Or we never had that taiva. We can't even understand that taiva. Why? It's not because you've broken that desire. It's because you or I am so sunk in a different place, in a different taiva. Because we're such big bali taiva in a different area that we're so obsessed with this that that doesn't hold sway. Not because it doesn't essentially impact certain people or that it itself is something that we're past. On the contrary, we're not even up to there. We're not, we're not even up to there. We haven't even got, it's like a person, you know, it's like traveling. Let's say a person goes into like a big mall. It's all, everything's kosher or whatever, a lot of different stores. And he can't even get to like make a selection from all the stores because the very first thing he sees, he stops, sets up shop, sits down and he orders. Well, hold on one second. You don't want to like walk around, see what the different options are. No, that's how we are, right? So we didn't even get up to Taiva's moment. That's a deep thing. It's not that we're better off. On the contrary, sometimes it could be that we're worse off, which means Rabbi Nachman doesn't mean to try to make us feel bad. But there are two things accomplished here. One, 
Al tama ba'asvachad yoy moischa. Constantly, constantly realize that there's work to do. There's work to do even in the areas that we think we're, we're so removed from. Maybe not. Maybe there's work to do even there. Number two, to judge other people favorably. Not to look upon other people involved in something that you think I'm totally removed from that. I, I, I have no, I have nothing to do with that. Not with that. I have nothing to do with. And the truth is maybe you have everything to do with that. But it's just that right now you're so caught up in what they say, everybody, you know, don't judge somebody for sinning differently than you do, right? Our sins are in a different area. So it overwhelms that and it prevents us from engaging in that. Wild thing. Because the other taiva is so strong that this taiva stops holding influence. So we find it's even worse. Because the other taiva, whatever it may be, is so powerful that the person either doesn't have time, doesn't have energy, doesn't have interest because they're completely and entirely subsumed within whatever it is that they are, in fact, stricken with. And he says, even though it could be a small thing, it doesn't have to be that it's worse, like worse, meaning that a person's involved in something worse. It could be a smaller thing, but it makes no difference. There's no difference. It's because this person is stuck in a very big, tremendous, dangerous pit of quicksand up to his ankle. And you've fallen into like a little pit, but you're up to your neck. So it doesn't make it, that's not how we, di- it, we distinguish between things, right? The question is, how stuck are we? How stuck? Even it could be something that's minimal. But if we're mamish stuck in it, it's all the same thing. It's just ego. So that means that we're, it means we're, it's just understand it's not about the severity of what it is that we're involved with. It's how much that has taken hold of our identity. So even if it's a little bit of jealousy, let's say, vis-a-vis like something that's really bad and immoral or whatever, just a little bit of, but if, if, it, if it consumes you, then you're consumed by it. So it could be a little bit less severe, but if the person's mamish completely wrapped up within it, the other type, it just seems smaller. And he says, well, this will finish. action. You can find a person is so stubborn. Like a baby. And there are little babies and there are grown-up babies. And that's also called action, right? Just like a baby is. Not in a positive sense, in a negative sense. Even though there's so much to, you look, to learn from youth. So much to learn. But there are also negative traits that we find. He says you can find that a baby or a toddler or somebody, in, to spite his mother, he's going to bang his head against the wall. Doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, you're, it's called to cut your nose to spite your face. I mean, you're hurting yourself, right? What is banging your head against the wall going to do? But you find sometimes a person can be so wrapped up in something that they lose themselves. Like a bait, like a child can totally lose themselves. I have this all the time with my toddler. He could, he could lose himself. And I, he's not a toddler anymore, so, right? Almost four years old. But he could, he could lose himself and do something that he knows he doesn't want to be doing. He could, he could not hurt himself. kol. <laughs> It's the same thing. Sometimes you could have people that even though those other taivas, those other things, they're they're for the taking and they're there and they're essentially uh, powerful in terms of their magneticism and their draw. But because they're so focused on one thing, they're mafker everything else. And then they think they're big tzaddikim. I was just saying they, me, me, right? Then sometimes I could think, oh, okay, so that's something I'm removed from. No, you fool. You're not removed from it. You're just so stuck in something else that you think that, that, that you have nothing to do with it. It's a strong musr. It's a strong musr from the Rebbe. Well, the salik, right? So he says, right? It's the same thing. Well, the salik, kol ha-taivas, v'shul eiz ha-taiva, yakshan and shu, right? And if we're stuck on one bad midah, sometimes it could look to us like we're removed from everything else. It's not really the case. Not really the case. And this goes hand in hand with it. Time now, and we'll see it in a different sicha with a different teaching in sicha saran. Rabbi Nachman says that when a person starts to work on themselves, he says it's like a pot that's boiling. All the stuff that was on the bottom, because things are heating up, things are moving, starts to rise to the top. Meaning, once we start to remove ourselves from one taiva, all of a sudden you can start to see other things opening up that you thought, that I thought, that we had no shaykhs to, no interest in whatever it is. Not the case. And so that's the job of spiritual work. Step by step, meet after meet 
to remain open in terms of what we might have to deal with and to remain non-judgmental or, or, or judging positively of other people and, uh, and, to, and to maintain that level of understanding and that level of insight. And so Hashem should help us to really put these three important teachings into practice. The first being about Hashem not doing anything twice the same, which we learned as the sod of the be'er, of that place within us, that Shabbos, that's the Makar Bracha. And we learned about the concept of olam haba in olam azeh and the ineffability, the inability to articulate or, or describe our spiritual experiences, to leave them there. And then finally, this that we learned about this possibility of thinking that we're very removed from something when in fact we're not. It's just that we're so stuck in something else that we just simply have no time or energy to engage in all the bad midas. And so this is, uh, it is important to keep in mind. Okay, so I appreciate you for joining. I'm just going to check because I saw the chat over here. I'm just going to read this. I once heard that the human brain cannot invent a new face. Every face we see in a dream is a face we must have seen before. Wow. Something beautiful and holy about that. Yeah, absolutely. Not me. Rabbi Nachman and the tzaddikim. That's unbelievable. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's really special. Thank you. And thank you for joining and thank you for learning with me. And thank you, Shalom, and specifically for sticking with us from the beginning. And, and if you're hopping on along the journey on this class trip with Rabbi Nachman, um, all the shirim are recorded. You can start from the beginning. You can learn through. And it's really building upon ideas, building and building deeper and deeper into the worldview of this incredible tzaddik. Ashrenu matayu chakkenu manoim garleinu. Ashrenu. What a privilege. Okay, wishing everybody the most phenomenal rest of your day and an amazing vacation, a continuation or end. For us, it's the beginning of Bena Okay, we'll be in touch, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. All the best.